Ah, yes. This screen. <laughs> this screen brings back so many memories for me and still makes me happy to this day. Oh, was it, what, what can't I say about Trail of Crondor? Just seeing this loading screen and knowing what it's going into, just this theme music right on this screen brings back memories from my childhood and, uh, like I said, to this day, this is one of my favorite games of all time. And hopefully I'm going to be able to convince you why. Now, good old games, or wait, they're known as GOG now, <laughs> since they have new games. Uh, they're running a contest right now they, to do a video about uh, something in their catalog. And I, I'm not in it to win it. I'm just in it to do a video about Betrayal of Crondor because this is one of my favorite games in their catalog. And just the fact that it's so easy to play now, even on a modern system, and that I can relive it as a 30-year-old now is amazing to me. Uh, so we'll go into it in a bit of detail of what I love about this game and probably why it's one of the best RPGs ever, and if you've never played it before, by the end of this I hope you do play it, because even to this day, it's RPGs, modern AAA RPGs could take a lot from this game and learn a lot. But yeah, we'll get into it in a second. Be right back. Alright, so what we're gonna do, just to get you in the mood for what this game's all about, we'll just start a new game. And I'm gonna do, I've been doing a let's play of this on my channel for quite a few months already. And just to let you know, just chapter one, the one we're starting with, I, I put 10 hours into on my Let's Play. So there's 10 hours of video of me just playing chapter one on my YouTube channel. And I'm, I think there's nine chapters of the game, if I recall. So that'll give you an idea how big of a game it is and how much you can sink into it for a game that came out back in 92, I want to say. So it's 20 years old now. <laughs> so we'll start a new game. Yes, I'm sure I want to start a new game. Chapter 1, Into a Dark Night. And sorry about showing some of my desktop with this. This is just the way it switches when it's in Windows resolution. Uh, just because, I don't know, that's the way it played back then, and obviously this doesn't look good at 1080p. <laughs> Blood-soaked rag collected at the boy's feet. One by one, he tended to the wincing soldier's purple wounds. Stitch saw, saved, <laughs> bandaged, did what little he could, and the leaping golden halo of firelight. Fortunately for his roadside patient, he could do no he could do more than most. Fingers slick with alum ointment, he worked feverently to tie off a cat gut cord, then brush the injury with a light touch that to an untrained eye would seem only a friendly pat. Others would recognize the telltale hand gesture as a magical ward against infection. Done, Owen sighed, wiping his hands in a rust colored cloth. No guarantees, though. The stitches may hold all the way to Lamut, and then again, push too hard and you could be bleeding like a stuck pig on Midsummer's. You did fine, Senor Lockley replied, smiling approval before rolling down his sleeve. Little scar, but it's good for a noble's reputation. What's the kingdom? Folk know he isn't resting on his laurels, and it impresses the ladies. I'll be sure to look you up in Tiburn if I ever... If ever I need stitching up again, the boy accepted the compliment with a humble nod while he packed, packaged away the rest of his medical supplies. His thoughts focused instead on a third man who slumped in the shadows across from them. Despite the manacles that bound the stranger's hands and the distance that separated them, the boy felt dreadfully exposed. His avenues of escape limited should Locklear's elven-looking prisoner decide to liberate himself. What did he do? Owen whispered, jerking his head towards the man. Korath? Let's just say that he had a disadvantage of being at the wrong place at the wrong time, Locklear said. Cautiously. <laughs> he snatched a greenish apple out of his knapsack, offering one to Owen. I have to take him to Crondor. Did he kill someone, Owen asked? No, he attacked you. The senor wiped apple juice from his mouth, shook his head. No, no, not exactly. Well, who cut you up then, before Locklear could reply? And here we go. Uh, the, the cutscenes in this, the, uh, I, I love this. Gorath leapt forward, his chain writhing between his metallic, his wrists like metallic vipers. Get out from underfoot, Owen. Assassins in the camp. Do not struggle so, Hasseth. I wish to keep you alive. But be glad I do not. The goddess of death will show you greater mercy. <laughs> 
Oh, it seems so camp nowadays, looking back on it. It looks like something, costumes and everything that you'd see in, say, a high school drama or something like that. But even even the character portraits and stuff, this, this was cutting edge at the time, and it adds a lot of character to the game. Looking back on it, I couldn't see... Even if it was remade this day, I couldn't see anyone else playing these characters because you get so invested in it. So this is the main interface for the overworld screens. You have character portraits for who's in your party. Right now we have Senor Locklear, we have Owen, and we have Gorath. So it's a first person view when you're on the overworld, like this. <laughs> and at the time, like I said, it was cutting edge graphics back then. Uh, now, not so much. <laughs> Even, well, for back then, I mean, compared to the stuff that was going on in consoles, say, uh, the 3D polygon stuff like Star Fox and stuff like that, this still looks better to me. But if we look at it, you have your standard inventory, and one of the interesting things about this is you can get any weapon at any time. And you're not limited to this. It's a sandbox world. Sometimes you're, you're limited to a path you could take, because you might be blocked off by, say, enemies or something in the plot that will keep you from progressing to a place you shouldn't go yet. But it's it's an open world. You can explore anywhere on the map to a degree, like I just said. But with the weapons and everything, you can get any at any time. And there's no real special um, end game weapons or anything like that. It You can get anything at any time, and it there's no real stats either. So you have a percentage of what quality it's in, and you can actually repair it and stuff like that. But if we go to the stat screen, this is what we have. They don't level up, per se. They have health, stamina, strength, um, and speed, and conditions. But you have percentages for what they're good at. And you can train them through doing the actual actions. Or you can actually go over here to the hilt of the sword. And if you click it, that'll specialize it as you're going along uh, over time. So I could specialize him in melee and defense without being in combat as I'm say, resting in camp and stuff like that, and it'll increase it. And in addition to when I get into combat, have defense and melee get increased with that. So the other actions you have is uh, casting, which is not applicable to him because he's not a mage. Um, assessment, which, let's see, well, crossbow, that's self-explanatory. Assessment is not sure exactly what that does. Even after all these years, I'm not positive what that does. I think that might be for um, when you're haggling and stuff like that, or when you're in a store. Or, oh wait, assessment? I think, no, you can use that in battle. I never really use it. it it's um, assessing your enemies in battle. I never really used it, <laughs> like I just said. Um, armor craft, which is repairing your armor. Weapon craft, repairing your weapons. Barding, which uh, you do in ends. You can bard while you're there, and you can either fail horribly and get tossed out of the, the pub, or you can earn money from doing it, so that's another way you can earn money, but you can only do it once per each tavern. Uh, haggling, so once you're trading in this game, you can actually haggle with uh, the merchants and try and get it for a lower price, which is always nice. Lockpicking skills, self-explanatory. Scouting, uh, scouting on ahead. <laughs> and stealth, which is another self-explanatory one. But we go over, we have Owen, who's our, one of our mages. And the other interesting thing is you have rations. Now, if I this is just left-clicking. That just says how many I have. But if I right-click it, it pulls up the flavor text for it. We're not going to read this whole thing right now. But one of the things that's interesting with the rations in this game, you need it to rest and camp at night and things like that. But also, you can get poisoned rations or uh, spoiled rations. So <laughs> they, they can spoil over time, and that hurts you when you're resting instead of healing you or allowing you to heal over time. You'll start to starve, or you get poisoned ones, and you get poison from it. So when you're picking these up off of enemies and stuff like that, you have to check and see if they're poisoned or things like that, which adds a nice little uh, flavor to the game. And same type of interface. We also have keys. Right now we have one key. Um, this is your money, 14 sovereigns and three rules. But the cool thing about this game is it's set in Raymond E. Feist's um, Rift War universe. And something I didn't know until I became an adult is that Neil Halford, one of the creators of this game, actually did all the writing for this game and the entire story along with the co-creator. And basically Raymond D. Feist didn't write the story or anything like that. It was just set in his universe and he got final say on it. So when I was a kid and we got this, it was I was about 11 or 12 and I played this with my neighbor because he had a really good computer and I had a Commodore 64 at the time. 
<laughs> so obviously I wasn't I didn't wasn't even in the DOS era. So we got this brand new from uh, CompUSA, a store that was by us, and we played it to death over at his house. And since it was based off Raymond D. Fay's story, and we loved this game so much, we ended up picking up his books and reading those afterwards. <laughs> and coming later, I mean later on in my life, I consider it kind of generic fantasy now. But there hasn't been a game to do that for me, to like a game that got me so involved that I want to go out and read the stories since then until The Witcher, which is an awesome game if you haven't played that either. But there's really not that many games that have a story like this. But okay, here's the guy we killed, now that I've been going off on a nostalgia tangent. So you get this flavor text every time you go into battle or you uh, encounter something like this, which is a really nice feature, but it gets old a little bit fast as well, because it kind of repeats itself after a while, but the first few times it's, it's it gets you more immersed in the game so, Korath looked for supplies, feeling a bit like a vulture, he turned the body this way and that as he searched for anything that might be of use well, uh, it just automatically took it off the screen, but yeah, you could pause it and read that if you want <laughs> you don't need me reading everything, so there's lockpicks, and like I said okay, you can divvy them up between your party, same thing with rations but, we're gonna check these and, okay, they're not spoiled, so We'll share with the party. And I'm going to advance this forward. Here, let me show you some of the other things we have. We have magic right here. And we don't really have any of the overworld spells right now. Besides Scent of Sarig. And the interesting thing is you don't have mana in this game. It goes based off of your health and stamina. The same thing for when you're doing combat actions. Your stamina gets drained first by enemies attacking you. Um, before your health does. And every time you attack, that uses some of your stamina. So it tastes... A nice tactical approach to the game. So right now, this would take... Okay, cast 5 health and stamina for 12 hours. So it can sense trap chests. And right now, Owen has 85 health and 85 stamina. So if we go back to his stat screen, let's exit this. You'll see that they have health right there, which doesn't get knocked off. First, like I said, you have the stamina. So you use stamina for all your actions when you're in combat or spells like that. And once you run out of stamina points, then they start draining your health. And once you hit zero health, obviously you die. <laughs> so you have the camping screen, like I said before. This is where you regain your health and stamina. Um, and it also says how many rations you have. So you can rest to a certain time of day. That we have the map screen. This is the local map, and you can zoom in and out <laughs> as you please. And then you have the overworld map, and it's, it's a nice chunk of uh, mid Kemia, which is where Rift War is set, and a lot of Raymond E. Feist's books. But this is where you can figure out where you need to get next, and if you're near any towns and things like that. And we also have, we'll go back to the main, we have our, we want to save it, and I'm not going to do it because, like I said, I'm doing a Let's Play right now, and I'm using the bookmarked file, so that's a quick save for the game. And you also have your main option screen, and there's not much really to see here. Start new game, restore game, save game, preferences. We have text speed, weight, medium, fast, step size, large, turn size, detail, maximum, CD music, introduction, which I have turned off. <laughs> but we'll go back. And unfortunately, even though this is the CD version of the game, um, it glitches audio-wise, and I'm running this on a Windows 7, like, system that shouldn't have any problem with DOSBox. It might just be the settings that came with it, the way that, that uh, GOG has it set up, but for some reason it glitches out every so often with the audio, which is kind of a shame because it sounds really good even for being a MIDI soundtrack. But what we're going to do, um, let me get over to the path. You navigate with... Uh, this is another interesting thing. You can lock yourself to the map with... I'll show you that in a second, but... Exploring the overworld, if you go off the paths and stuff like that, you can find things like this. <laughs> we have a chest right here. And hopefully this is what I'm thinking it is. Okay, Locklear gritted his teeth. While they had agreed the box should be opened, he was privately concerned that the previous user might have left behind an unpleasant surprise. So this is just a standard chest, and we've got some money in it. But there are other chests, which I'm going to go hunt down and a battle, so I can show you the systems for those as well. Let me just get on the path and show something... That's... where is the path? Okay, so right here. One of the interesting things you can do in this game is you can lock yourself right onto the path using this key. So now I no longer... if I navigate this way, it will automatically do this. This is when I'm pressing forward. So I'm pressing forward, going this way, and it just automatically locks you to that. Okay. 
So this is some more of the flavor text and the story, which I don't want to ruin for you as it's a really good story. So I'm going to leave this off here and I'm going to go and find a battle and one of the other chests that I want to tell you about. So be right back. Okay, so I've come across a battle. So like I said, we have flavor text before everything. So these guys were on the road ahead of me and I ran right into it. Here's the flavor text. This is the battle screen. I love this because it's turn-based and it's tactical. So the way it is, is it's an isometric kind of type view or well, actually third person type view. We're not going to say isometric. And the things, like I said before, with the health and stamina, this comes into play. But one thing that you'll notice right now is they moved the bad guys in blue, moved immediately next to Owen. And when someone's next to Owen or another spellcaster that you get later on in the game, they can't cast spells. So first thing we need to do is move him across the map somewhere so he can cast spells. Now, everybody has options. Um, I'm trying to remember what they all are. This I know is defense. This, I think, is way to turn. That is to automatically do the battle. That's um, The computer takes over and plays it for you, which is kind of pointless. This is to regain health and stam. I don't remember what this does, and I don't exactly want to do it quickly. So I have the option of going after everybody. So you'll see that... It can do 17 damage with what he has, and he has a 68% accuracy chance of hitting him. So we're going to go after this guy, and we missed. So Gorath being next to him, once you're next to an enemy, you have an option of left-click or right-click. You have thrust or swing. So he's got a 25 damage, it'll do with 52% um, accuracy with thrust or swing, which is 32, and a 37% chance of hitting. And, you, of course, we're going to go beast mode and try and swing on him, and we missed. So now it's their turn again, and Owen, he can cast spells. Unfortunately, he only really has one or two right now. Invitation, um, as I said, you can cast it for 1 to 10 health. Um, and actually, let me show this real quick. So this is how you would cast it. This is 2 health or stamina. This is how effective it's going to be. So I can cast it up to 10 health or stamina to cast it. And you can do these when you get spells later on in the game, like um, Fireball or something like that. Um, but let's go back. I do not want to cast this. Um, I think I'm kind of committed to it. now. One of us. Yes, I'm committed to it. So I'm just going to do one health and stamina. I wasn't going to do Despair Thy Eyes, which blinds the opponent, which is obviously better tactically. But this is an early battle, so I'm not going to lose it anyways. So if I cast Imitation on him, oh, it drags the enemy right over to Owen, which is... Not exactly the good thing, because he's kind of weak, he's a mage. Or a spellcaster, if you will. So, we have a, a better chance of swing with uh, Locklear being next to this guy. He's got a 53% chance, we'll go for it. And he hit for 19 damage. So, Gorath, we're going to move him over here to help Owen. <laughs> and of course, oh, they're all going after Owen now. Alright, so Owen we're going to defend with. And get everybody over to them. Alright, so we'll do a thrust, 20 damage, and he missed, and Owen was blocking him. We'll block again with Owen, because his melee attacks really don't do anything. So we'll thrust attack, and he's not dead yet, surprisingly. Okay, so let us do a thrust, and miss, 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 son of a, alright. So Owen, you defend again. We could move him out of harm's way, but there's only two guys. So we'll do a thrust attack, miss, <laughs> thrust Miss. Oh, when they hit Owen for 20. Ouch. <laughs> see, so if I do a swing with Owen, he's got a 38% chance of hitting. And it's nice that you actually see the stats for this. So we're going to defend again. It's not kind of like... A, it's kind of a randomized dice roll type of effect, but you actually see the percentile you have for it. Thrust, thrust. Let's just get through this battle really quick. We're just going to go beast mode thrust on these guys. Okay, one of them's dead. <laughs> oh, and they're damaging Owen. But this is, I just want to show off the battle screens. And it's not clear. He can't get to him, really. Okay, we'll move him over here. Breath, swing. Go swing and see if we can just. Oh, Owen hit with the swing. Wow. Okay, so lock clear thrust. He's surrounded, so he can't just flee from the battle anymore. Ah, oh, and he's not. Okay, so he's dead. Alright, like I said, flavor text again. This happens after every single battle. So the battle was won, search the bodies. They may have valuable supplies, Locklear suggested. Then amend it and make it quick. If there are more of them out there waiting there, 
There are more of them waiting out there. Let's not be here when they return. Okay, so once again, like that body at the beginning, I can search the bodies that are on the battlefield and loot them for our supplies as much as fits in my inventory. And you have a limited inventory slots. Um, I think it's like 16 slots or something like that. Um, armor counts as four and weapons count as two. So you, you can only take so much loot with you. So yeah, I'll be right back once I find one of the other features that I want to show you. Okay, something else that's worth noting. You you notice that it's gotten dark. <laughs> so as you're going, time progresses, and there is a day-night cycle. Oh, and I just ran into another battle. But yeah, I'm not going to show this again. I just wanted to point out that it actually cycles between day and night. So yeah, I'll be right back when I actually find what I'm looking for for you guys. <laughs> okay, I found one of the main other things I wanted to show you. Um, looks like a standard chest, doesn't it? But unlike the standard, uh, open it with a key and, uh, key and lock chest, or a lock pick. This is a Morello word lock. Now, you can read all the text on the screen and everything like that. But what this is, is you have to solve a riddle in order to <laughs> open up the chest. And this is another really awesome feature of this game. So, you have some actual thinking you have to do. So, this one I'll solve as we're doing, as I'm talking about this. But, um... In these chests, there's obviously usually some high-level items and stuff like that, and you'll see it in a second once I solve this. But you have a set um, amount of letters and stuff like that on the tumblers to figure it out. And the solution to this one um, is candle, <laughs> which I'd, is not that hard to figure out once you do some critical thinking. And there's a ton of these chests in the game, so it adds a whole new dimension to it. Um, if you want to get loot, you don't just have, oh, my lockpicking skill is 100% so I can open this chest. No, you actually have to use your thinking, or you could use a cheat guide or a guide on the internet, but what's the fun in that? Uh, yeah, but the only other things I really haven't shown is interaction with NPCs, which is pretty much the same thing as you saw in the opening text of them talking back and forth, or you get a long line of text when you knock on someone's door. And there is a lot of writing in this game. Um, in addition to the flavor text, the story is amazing to this. Like I said, people thought this was a Raymond Defy story. And I found out later on, as I said, that it was all Neil Halford. And what's funny enough is after this came out, these some of the characters in this game, like uh, Owen and Gorath, weren't in the canon books for the Rift War series. And he actually adapted, Raymond D. Feist wrote a story afterwards called uh, Crondor the Betrayal, I believe, that adapted some of the characters that weren't in his stories before from this game into his stories. So that tells you how amazing the writing is for this game. Um, and when it comes to RPGs, that's what I want. I want an engrossing story. Gameplay comes second, but in this game, the, it's, the gameplay is amazing. It's immersive. You get into it. There's tactical battles to it. There's traps you can run into that you have to figure your way out. And the story. The story is second to none. I, I can't say enough about Neil Halford and his writing. Um, the other thing to note, uh, I'm going to switch graphics in a little bit, and so you don't just have to stare at this. I'll pull up some of the wallpapers from uh, that come in this package that you, so you can take a look at that as well. But this comes in a package called uh, the Betrayal of Crondor Pack. And funnily enough, it comes with the sequel. Uh, and I'll get into that in a second. But... I just can't say enough. If this doesn't get you into the game, let me just put it this way. It won, I believe, the 1994 Role-Playing Game of the Year Award. And it's a shame so many people have slept on this game. Uh, it's it's truly a classic. But I'll be right back with some... Okay, I could go on and on about this game and how awesome it is and how much I love it. But it's also worth noting that it came in a CD and disc format, and the version you get on Good Old Games, or GOG, I keep, I keep referring to it as good old games. I'm sorry, guys. You, you'll always be good old games to me, because that's primarily where I get all my good old games. But it comes in a package with a Betrayal at Antara as well, which was kind of a disappointment as a child, because you get so involved in the story for Crondor. And like I said, we actually went out and got the Raymond D. Feist books and were reading them afterwards, and got so invested in this universe. And I, Sierra comes out with... Uh, or I believe it was Dynamics that came out with this. It was published by Sierra. But they came out with Betrayal and Antara. And of course, we bought that immediately off the shelf, thinking, hey, this is a sequel to Crondor. But no, it wasn't. It was the same type of engine, and it was done with a completely different team. So the original team that made Crondor so special 
uh, didn't make Antara special. <laughs> it, it was a new team. It was a similar engine. A um, little bit better graphics. Uh, the story was eh, so-so. Didn't have the rating behind it, and it, it didn't have the charm of, like I said, the live-action kind of role-playing type looking guys in it. It was all drawn, uh, hand-drawn stuff, which which was nice, but it, it kind of felt like a cop-out as a kid. You're, you're thinking that you're getting a sequel to uh, Krondor, and it turns out it's just kind of cashing in on your the name of Betrayal at Krondor by calling it Betrayal at Antara. They also came out with a sequel, um, semi-sequel of Return to Krondor, and once again it wasn't done by the same team, and the gameplay was different in it. It's not a bad game by itself, but it's still not the same thing. And what's also worth noting is, with all the Kickstarter stuff that's going on right now, um, Neil Halford, as I mentioned earlier, he was one of the main creators of the game, the one that did most of the writing for it. He actually started a petition, not a Kickstarter, but a petition to see if people are interested in a spiritual sequel to Betrayal of Krondor. And I urge people, I'm going to have the link underneath this video to the petition so you can read it yourself. It's a spiritual sequel because Raymond D. Feist and uh, the world of Midchemia is tied up uh, at the moment, so they can't do a direct sequel to it, even though they had one written, and apparently, for some reason, Dynamics just blew that, and Sierra... Or the, the way publishers tend to go down the drains at some point with the good ideas and the teams they have. Uh, but he he wants to do a game with the original team and lineup that did this, that made this game so great. Uh, a spiritual sequel. And, like I said, it's not a Kickstarter yet. I wish he would do a Kickstarter so I could just throw my money right at it because this is, like I said, one of my favorite games of all time. And if you guys who haven't played it, pick it up. I urge you to. It's one of the best gaming experiences you can have your entire life. <laughs> uh, at least to me. For role-playing games. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to leave it there. I sound like a total fanboy, and I am. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I hope you guys have enjoyed watching this and kind of going down a nostalgia-filled uh, path with me. But I urge you to check out uh, the petition as well and pick up this game. It's one of the best out there. But yeah, if, if you want more of it, I've been doing a Let's Play, so check that out as well. So you can, you can just sit there and listen to me blab on and on and talk about this game for hours on end. But yeah, this has been Deadly Habit. I hope you've enjoyed watching this. And yeah, I hope all you at GOG that don't have this pick it right up. Alright, check you guys later. Peace.